Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Courtney if you don't know me already and on my channel I react to all things America and other stuff as well. So if you want to get a New Zealander's perspective definitely hit that subscribe button down below. So in today's video we're checking out the Green Beret who went on a one-man rampage to save his comrades. Crazy. I'm looking forward to this video and looking forward to this story. Sounds like some extreme bravery and we're going to check it out today. Leave any thoughts and comments down below or if you want to teach me something new definitely feel free to down below. I learn a lot not only from these videos but from you guys who comment down below. Um, but yeah without any further ado let's get into today's video. The Green Beret, who went on a one-man rampage, Roy Benavidez, the Vietnam War. Mm. Roy Benavidez's life had been rough as a child. Both his parents had died. He was bullied by his classmates because of his mixed Yakui Indian and Mexican heritage and had to leave school in eighth grade to help his family. At the age of 19, Benavidez joined the army, serving in the Korean War in the Texas Army National Guard. He married Hilaria Lala Coy Benavidez in 1959 and completed airborne training, becoming assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. In 1966, Sergeant Roy Benavidez was in hospital after stepping on a landmine. Doctors said he would never walk again. He had been sent to Vietnam in 1965 as an advisor for the ARVN troops there. Benavidez was carrying out a classified operation alone to gather evidence that the North Vietnamese troops were posing as Viet Cong. While he was on patrol along a narrow trail disguised as a Viet Cong guerrilla, he stepped on a landmine. Sometime later, a squad of Marines came across Benavidez. They initially thought it was a booby trap, but were surprised when they flipped him over and discovered the man in Viet Cong pajamas was Hispanic and wearing U.S. Army dog tags. He was soon evacuated to the hospital. In wow. hospital in the U.S. two months later, Benavidez had recovered and awoke. His memories came back to him. The doctor told him he would never walk again. His spine had been damaged and his brain had rattled in his skull. Nevertheless, Benavidez, sitting in his wheelchair, begged the doctors not to discharge him from the army. The army was his life. Determined, Benavidez got up from his bed night after night, dragging himself to the wall and putting weight on his legs. For weeks, serious? he pushed through the pain, going further a distance than before, which surprised the doctors. Six months later, with his wife Lala's support, Roy Benavidez walked out of the hospital. Oh my he was promised gosh. only a desk job at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Wow. But determined and exercising every day, he wow. trained vigorously and qualified for the Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. Wow. He would be assigned to Detachment B-56, 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, 1st Special Forces. Oh, Six no. hours in hell. Now it was 1968. Staff Sergeant Roy Benavidez, now with a code name Tango Mike Mike, was back in Vietnam and was off duty attending church. But his mind was fixed on the panicking radio chatter from the front lines. In Loc Ninh, Vietnam, near the Cambodian border, a 12-man Special Forces reconnaissance team, which included his close friends, Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, Staff Sergeant Lloyd Frenchy Mousseau, Specialist 4 Brian O'Connor, and nine Montagnard tribesmen who were part of the Civilian Irregular Defense Group Program, or CIDG, were surrounded by a battalion numbering 1,000 battle-hardened North Vietnamese soldiers. Everyone in the unit had been wounded or killed in earlier fighting, and three of the helicopters sent to rescue them had been unable to extract them due to heavy enemy fire. Wow. When the helicopters returned, they were riddled with bullets. One of them, the door gunner, Michael Craig, age 19, had been hit several times and died in Benavidez's arms. There was no way Benavidez was going to leave his friends out in the jungle. Benavidez jumped onto a returning helicopter that was going back in, volunteering so quickly that he didn't have time to get his M16, so was only armed with a Bowie knife and medical supplies. Benavidez described it as going into autopilot. As he was approaching the extraction zone, Benavidez realized his fellow team members were too severely wounded to run the distance to the helicopter. There was so much enemy gunfire that the pilot, Larry McKibben, had to zigzag in an attempt to dodge it, but was nevertheless oh, able to provide covering fire. 
Benavidez jumped out with a medical bag, ran through the jungle to the wounded men under heavy enemy fire, taking a shot to the leg, which he initially thought was a thorn bush. He found Musso first against a tree whose eyeball had been shot out and was oh hanging down his cheek, but was determined to keep shooting back. The CIDG were in a pool of blood and patched up as best they could. Benavidez dragged everyone into a defensible position to direct their fire at the enemy and provided morphine to the wounded. He then saw O'Connor and an interpreter CIDG who he motioned to to move over to him, but the gunfire started again and they took cover. Another round then hit Benavidez in his thigh. On adrenaline, he popped the green smoke for McKibben in the rescue helicopter to pick them up. While everyone who could move got into the chopper, he suppressed the tree line with an AK-47 he had picked up to cover O'Connor and the interpreter who crawled towards the helicopter. Now Benavides was looking for the team leader, Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, who had been killed and who also had intel on him that could not get into enemy hands. Benavides found his body and proceeded to drag him to the chopper when he was shot again, oh this time in the stomach and hit in the back by shrapnel from a nearby grenade, knocking him out. When he awoke, Benavides was forced to leave his dead friend's body. Disaster had also struck. The chopper had crashed to the ground from enemy fire. The oh pilot, gosh. McKibben, was dead. Oh my gosh. Five of the men on board, including Mousseau, survived the crash, as did O'Connor and the interpreter who didn't get into the helicopter. Benavidez pulled them out of the wreckage, dispensed morphine, set up a perimeter around the crash site, and called in heavy air support from the F-100s above, which dropped napalm on the enemy position. When the jets ran out of fuel and had to leave, the enemy machine gun fire started again. Benavidez gave O'Connor a third shot of morphine and took another bullet to the leg. Their position what? was surrounded by North Vietnamese soldiers. It looked hopeless. But a helicopter finally came to their rescue. Benavidez and the rescue team carried and dragged the wounded men onto the chopper, but the landing zone was still being fired upon by NVA troops, to the extent that two men were shot in the back as they crawled to it. Shrapnel wounds to his face from earlier caused Benavidez's vision to be blurred from the blood in his eyes. When he went to get Mousseau, an NVA soldier butted his rifle into Benavidez's head and jaw and slashed his arm with his bayonet. He shouted to O'Connor to shoot, but he was too drugged from morphine to react. Benavidez pulled out his bowie knife and stabbed the NVA soldier till he was dead. What? He then dragged Mousseau to the helicopter and killed two more NVA with an AK-47 who were out of the helicopter's side gunner's arc of fire. And then he made oh. one more trip to get the interpreter and destroy any classified material with blood still obscuring his vision. Only then did he allow the others to pull him onto the helicopter, the last man to leave the battlefield. At this point, the round that had hit his stomach had exposed his intestines, which he was trying to hold in with his hands. The helicopter, badly shot up and with no instruments left, managed to take off. Oh my gosh. When they Did landed, survive? the wounded were unloaded and examined one by one. It had turned out that Benavidez had even loaded three dead enemy soldiers into the helicopter in case they had classified materials. They were left to the side, as was Benavidez. He couldn't move or speak because of the broken jaw from the rifle butt. The blood over his eyes had glued them shut, and with 37 bayonet, bullet, and shrapnel wounds all over his body, he looked dead. The medics started placing him in a body bag and started zipping him up when a friend noticed him and said, That's Roy! That's Roy Benavidez! The doctor said there was nothing that could be done, but Benavidez mustered his last bit of energy and spat in the doctor's face, causing the doctor to say, I think he'll make it. He was flown to Japan for intensive surgery, then Brook oh Army God. Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston, where he stayed for almost a year. Roy Benavides had survived six hours in hell and saved eight lives. Benavides's commander had put him in for the Distinguished Service Cross because the process for awarding a Medal of Honor would take much longer, and he was unsure if Benavides would live or die before he could have received it. Finally, on February 24th, 1981, President Ronald Reagan would present Roy Benavidez the Medal of Honor. Reagan said, if the story of his heroism were a movie script, you would not believe it. Benavidez said of his actions, the real heroes are the ones who gave their lives for their country. I don't like to be called a hero. I just did what I was trained to do. Master Sergeant Roy Benavidez died on November 29, 1998 at the age of 63.
subscribe for more Vietnam War history videos. I never would have expected that. What an amazing, amazing man. I'm in awe of his story and his fight within him like throughout his whole life from when he stood on the mine and then he was like so determined to not only walk but stay in the army and then oh my gosh he literally took down all those people and saved all of his friends and he got shot multiple times that's crazy this doesn't seem real like wow and he survived he survived wow the fight in this man the fight amazing wow i'm i'm in shock honestly and in awe and you know that these kind of people exist there's like a fire in their soul they were putting him into a body bag and hearing the description of his injuries how did he not die that's incredible he is an amazing amazing man i just can't even get over that wow I just don't know how you could physically get through that and you know getting shot all those multiple times under fire like it's a soldier right there it's a green beret right there seriously also i'm looking at the comments and it's like seriously where is this man's movie i agree where is this man's movie is there a movie because this is something i think that should be shown to people instead of like fake war movies right actually show the heroes that did this stuff like literally ramboed their way through the situation that seriously not many people would do or could do like that's a story that needs to be told i think that's insane isn't it um so thank you so much for watching today's video with me guys that was that really really touched me seriously that was just insane right i'm sure you guys agree i'm not sure if you guys know about him or not but i certainly didn't and it's honestly an honor to learn about these situations but yeah if you guys have anything to add below definitely feel free to i not only learn so much from these videos watching them with you but also from you guys commenting down below as well so definitely feel free to leave a comment down below um thank you guys so much for watching i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did that was absolutely insane and incredible i never would have thought a story like this would be would would exist but yeah thanks guys so much for watching and tuning into today's video and i will see you in my next one bye guys mm -hmm.